Hi there class. In this video we're going to talk about some core economic ideas that underpin the modern world of finance. Remember this slide from our first video? Well, this video will run deep on the context, the historical events that created the modern background for finance, including the venture capital funding of startups and a lot of the world events we discuss each week. Here's our agenda for this video. This is Thomas Sowell. Sal grew up in Harlem, served as a Marine in the Korean War, and then earned degrees from Harvard, Columbia, and the University of Chicago. He's now a professor at Stanford and a fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's written extensively on issues of race and economics. Basically, he's an all-around intellectual powerhouse, which is why I chose his words to kick off this discussion of economics. Sal says in his seminal book, Basic Economics, that we cannot opt out of economic issues and decisions. Our only options are to be informed, uninformed, or misinformed. My goal here is to inform. We've also seen this guy before. Adam Smith was a Scotsman who overthrew the mercantilist ideas of his day in his book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. In The Wealth of Nations, Smith poses that wealth is not finite, but that wealth can be created, and that the mechanism for creating wealth in an economy is trade, that transactions create wealth. In addition to the prima facie example of the United States and other countries that have espoused free trade, most of which in their modern GDP dwarf the supposed total amount of wealth in the world during Adam Smith's day, I also have this little example of how this works. Let's say we have an economy of three, and each of these three has some resources candy bars. Now, as a fan of British chocolate myself, I hold that not all chocolate is created equal. People have different tastes, so the candy bars are not worth the same amount to all people. Here, the current distribution of candy bars produces an average satisfaction level of five. But what if these three were allowed to trade their candy bars? Through trade, the distribution of candy bars can be such that it creates greater satisfaction. The same resources, with more trade between the parties, is able to increase the value. Smith said that to get an economy to grow, you need three basic things. Individual freedom to engage in transactions and pursue your own self-interest. Justice, so you don't have people rampaging around stealing from each other. And a system for redress when contracts or trades don't go to everyone's satisfaction. And finally, competition to put downward pressure on monopolies. The big question ever since has been, how much of each of these do you need? Do you need more justice, that is, more regulation and oversight, or more freedom? Do you need unbridled competition or some limited forms of monopoly, like patents and copyrights? Ultimately, Smith puts forward the notion that the most efficient way to gain value is free market economics. Free market economics would become accepted fact across most of the globe. Smith's other famous idea is that if individuals are allowed to pursue their own self-interest, that the public interest will also be advanced as if by an invisible hand. Effectively, as the overall wealth in an economy grow as the result of ever-increasing numbers of transactions, there will be more resources to meet the needs of all involved. The United States became the great experiment of Smith's ideals, and arguably the greatest proof that free market economics, or what we sometimes call the free enterprise economic model, is unparalleled. In fact, it became so accepted, and people and countries prospered so much, that it was inevitable that contrarians would arise. And so, this guy shows up. Somehow, this penniless alcoholic, who kept his family in such squalor that four of his seven children died due to the poor conditions, was able to write a pamphlet which would go on to inspire more human suffering, murder, and death than any other single person in history. And he would give us the word most often associated with free market economics, and that is capitalism. Puzzling, to be sure. In fact, I recently came across this chart in one of the venture capital newsletters I've subscribed to. Enough about Marx. We're moving on to talk about gold. Through much of US history, the currency has been backed by gold. Gold represents a hard asset whose value is intrinsic and universal. Essentially, during times when the currency is backed by gold, paper notes are merely convenient representations of the thing of real value, the gold. Prior to 1900, a de facto gold standard exists because there wasn't an established system for foreign exchange. There was no governing body that determined that one US dollar was worth two French francs, for instance. The universal currency was gold. As a result, most international trade was done either in barter, goods themselves, or in gold. Since transactions are the key to building wealth, you can see how important gold was to a country's future. 
The thing was that countries had a lot of manipulations they could make in the price of gold and how their own currencies converted to gold. So in 1913, the United States created the Federal Reserve as its central bank with the intention that it would exert its influence to stabilize the price of gold, currency, and inflation. At this time, the U.S. was on the gold standard, which means its currency was backed by gold and you could actually redeem banknotes for their value in gold. In 1914, World War I begins and the gold standard is temporarily dropped for the duration of the war. After the war, a British economist named John Maynard Keynes rose to prominence for some of his unorthodox but seemingly inspired ideas. One of these was the paradox of thrift. Keynes noted that if wealth was created by increasing transactions, then saving would have a negative effect on wealth creation. The paradox is that if people attempt to hold on to their wealth by sticking it in a, in a mattress or a piggy bank, they're withdrawing it from circulation, limiting the number of transactions that can happen, and essentially reducing the wealth potential of the economy. Keynes introduced the idea that if an economy was struggling and running a deficit, it could stimulate the economy by borrowing money, temporarily increasing its debt, and injecting that money into the economy. Transactions would increase, wealth would be created, and that wealth would be sufficient to repay the debt and pull the economy back into healthy territory. Since injecting this money into the economy meant getting it into the hands of people, business, or government agents who were going to spend it, money burning a hole in someone's pocket was going to increase the demand for something to buy, uh, stimulus spending became known as demand-side economics. The stock market crash and subsequent Great Depression caused a lot of people to doubt that free markets were self-correcting and could function without government intervention. In 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected in the midst of a loss of faith in monetary institutions. People rush to the bank to exchange their currency for gold because they're afraid the banks will fail and their currency will become worthless. In response, FDR closes the banks and orders all their gold to be sent to the Federal Reserve to avoid being redeemed by bank patrons. He then calls for American citizens to turn in their gold for U.S. dollars as a matter of patriotic duty. The exporting of gold outside the United States is outlawed, and the gold reserves of the nation's banks are stockpiled at Fort Knox. Let me take just a minute to introduce you to this character. This is Harry Dexter White. White was born in Boston in 1892, the son of Lithuanian Jews. He graduated from Stanford and then from Harvard with a PhD in economics at the age of 31. After graduation, he goes and teaches for a few years, and then in 1932, when FDR is elected, he is recruited into the Treasury Department. He dutifully enacts the provisions of the New Deal and provides economic analysis for the Treasury Department. Back to FDR. A couple of years into his presidency, the Securities Acts that we've mentioned before were passed by Congress. And around this time, Keynes sends a copy of his book, The Multiplier Effect, to, uh, to Roosevelt and other heads of state. FDR is impressed with Keynes and adopts many Keynesian ideas in an effort to pull the country out of the Great Depression. By 1934, the Gold Reserve Act is passed, which requires anyone who owns gold privately to be licensed. It also explicitly permits the U.S. government to pay its debts in gold. During Roosevelt's presidency, White's star is on the rise. He climbs through the ranks inside the Treasury Department. In 1941, the U.S. joins World War II. At that time, White becomes one of the top economists in the country and is placed in charge of all international economic analysis. As the war enters its last year, it is becoming clear that the Allies will win. However, the economies of many of the world's nations are in shambles. Great Britain has incurred large debts to the U.S., and others around the world are struggling. In order to address some of the problems and prepare for the end of the war, an economic summit is held in the Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. 730 delegates from 44 countries attend. Although all of these have a vested interest in the outcome, the conference is really dominated by two major players. Keynes for the UK and White for the US. Keynes is pushing hard for interests of Great Britain. White, of course, is representing the interests of the United States. Key outcomes from Bretton Woods are agreements from member nations to maintain more open and free trade. The idea here is that the fewer barriers to trade exist, the more nations will trade with each other and the resulting wealth gain will increase their relative wealth and stability. This agreement would evolve into what we know today as the World Trade Organization, or WTO.
There's also the creation of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is the precursor to what we know today as the World Bank. This body would provide financing to rebuilding countries damaged by the war and in the future to those countries who needed loans or other types of financing. Finally, out of these agreements came the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. The IMF was designed originally as a clearinghouse for currency exchange between countries. So what I want to point out here is that a number of the most significant economic entities in the world today were born at this conference at Bretton Woods. Keynes goes so far as to pro propose a new currency, the Bancor, and that this be created with the intent that the Bancor is an impartial adjudicator of currency exchanges. The idea is that the Bancor would have a set exchange rate, and using it as a vehicle, you could fairly exchange currency across countries. The Bancor could also be used as a reserve currency to, to prop up um, the currencies of various countries. White says, no new currency is really needed. Why not just use the U.S. dollar? It's already backed by gold. And the U.S. flatly rejects the idea of the bank war. And without the U.S., nobody else can make it work. When it came down to it, Keynes was the world's most famous economist, and White represented the world's most powerful economy. So the question was, between these two, who would win out? There was no question. White leveraged the influence and power of the United States to get the best agreement he could for the U.S. Three of the most enduring, cooperative financial organizations in the world are launched, and all three are based in the U.S. and mostly controlled by the U.S. Russia notably declines to sign the accords. As World War II ends, the dominoes fall that kick off the nuclear arms race in the Cold War between the U.S. and Russia. In the subsequent years, the U.S. arrests and interrogates a Soviet spy who starts naming names, others in the U.S., especially government officials who are passing information to the Russians. White is one of those named. White denies all of this, of course, and in 1948, he testifies vehemently before Congress in his defense. But the stress of it all is too much for him. Three days later, he dies of a heart attack. The official cause of death was an overdose of his heart medicine. With that cloud over his head, the memory of White and his accomplishments at Bretton Woods fades into history, but the effect lives on. Ultimately, the U.S. dollar, backed by gold, became the world's reserve currency. This means that where the U.S. holds gold as the underlying value for their currency, other countries are using U.S. dollars backed by gold to prop up their own currencies. Now, Keynes himself actually died a couple of years before White, but where he didn't have the shame of being noted as a communist, his legacy was much more palatable and acceptable. And he's undoubtedly the most famous economist from this period of time. As a result, Keynesian economics became the official monetary policy of the United States and would remain so for nearly 50 years. The U.S. would not depart from it until the end of the Carter administration in 1979. The Bretton Woods system holds more or less intact as is until 1973. Other nations have been chafing with the idea that the U.S. held as much sway over the organizations that came out of Bretton Woods as they did and also that the U.S. has so much control with the dollar being used as the reserve currency. France, in particular, has been redeeming U.S. notes for gold in an attempt to manipulate the foreign exchange. This starts to put pressure on the U.S. There are alarmists complaining that this will undermine the security of the United States. As a result, President Nixon pulls the plug on the gold standard, and we haven't gone back to it ever since. Is it a good thing that we left the gold standard? Is it a bad thing? Well. After Nixon made that move, foreign entities freak out and the U.S. has a pretty serious recession. But the U.S. dollar is no longer backed by gold, and we've never gone back to it. Today, the U.S. currency is backed instead by the full faith and credit of the United States. Basically, the U.S. dollar is the promise that the United States says that dollar is worth a dollar. A currency that isn't tied to a hard asset like this is called a fiat currency. Okay, that covers gold and reserves, right? We had a bankers, the foundation of institutions, a war, a spy, some unexplained deaths. Pretty dramatic period of time. Now we're going to move on. As a refresher, here's a basic supply and demand curve. When supply grows, price goes down. If demand grows instead, then price goes up. Friedrich Hayek won Nobel Prize in 1874 for his theory, which says that if you know the price, you know all you need to know about the issues present in the supply chain of getting a product to market. For example, you don't need to know that there's a labor strike in Brazil. The increased price paid for the good imported from Brazil reflects everything about it that might impact the price. 
Hayek's economic thoughts are referred to as the Austrian school of economics because Hayek was originally from Austria. And even though today we look at Hayek and Keynes as being diametrically opposed, Keynes was more and more a fan of Hayek at the end of his life. And it was pointed out to him that some of his students and disciples were taking his, t- his, uh, his philosophies and doing things with them that were maybe different than he intended. And he derided all of them as, as no more than fools. Um, Keynes, was, Keynes was a little bit of a proud guy. All right, let's take a look at some more political stuff. In the late 1970s, a second oil crisis hits the country. Just as the Great Depression had shaken faith in the previous economic system, this crisis shakes faith in the system of Keynes. At the University of Chicago is another famous economist by the name of Milton Friedman. Friedman was an early disciple of Keynes. He ultimately abandons the ideas of Keynes and establishes a new school of thought, sometimes referred to as the Chicago School of Economics, since Friedman is based at the University of Chicago. This new economic idea is called monetarism. With monetarism, instead of the government collecting money from taxes or going into debt to stimulate the economy, it simply lowers taxes and lets more of the money stay where it is. The idea being that people and companies with more money will invest it, will hire more, will produce more goods to be sold. In other words, they will stimulate the economy from the side of supply rather than demand. This is called supply-side economics. Monetarism became the official U.S. monetary policy and that of other nations from 1979 all the way through until 2007. We're starting to get pretty close to our own time. This is the fiscal policy espoused by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. So as you hear people either think that Reagan and Thatcher were great or think that Reagan and Thatcher were were terrible, it's usually around their ideas attached to um, to the fiscal policy called monetarism. The result of monetarism is twofold. First, it creates a period of unprecedented economic growth. Things are humming. But second, with that growth comes an increase in income inequality. With all of the players allowed to grow kind of unfettered, some ultimately grow more than others. So even though economic conditions improve for everybody, those at the top gain disproportionately, increasing the gap between rich and poor. In early 2008, Rather than attempt to fix these inequities, President Bush reverts the U.S. policy to Keynes and passes a stimulus bill in response to the growing issues surrounding the housing crisis, which foreshadow the meltdown in the fall of 2008. Newly elected President Obama will double down on the Keynesian idea of economic stimulus. Within about a year, there is a whole-scale bipartisan reversion from monetarism to uh, Keynesianism. And it all, it all happens, like these dominoes start falling in 2007 and 2008. To me, it kind of feels like we did this. But that's the economic drivers at work up through the financial crisis. In our next economy video, we'll go into more detail about that. And that brings us to the last section. I'll start this section with two clips from We the Economy. So, I promised some people with money that if they gave me some of their money, I would make them a movie about money. This is that film about money. You probably think that this is money and that banks are where your money is stored for safekeeping, guarded in big underground vaults by guys like Gustavo. Well, you're wrong, like really wrong, because it turns out that money is not a thing and banks, in order to be banks, Well, they need to be empty. Back in the old days, banks used to look like well-fortified temples. In fact, they were temples. Remember Jesus and the money changers? Nowadays, they've all turned into pharmacies and retail outlets. And actual banks these days now look like airport business class lounges. It's like they've given up even pretending that this is where they store the cash. I wonder why that is. Maybe if we made an awkward educational video on the subject, we could figure that out. So let's ask the question. What happens to your money when you deposit it in a bank? Here, for example, I am going to deposit $100. Thanks, James. Your account has now been credited with $100. You will receive 1% interest, so in a year, your account will have grown to $101. That's amazing, Ridu. But how does that happen? Does my money grow like a yogurt culture down in the vault with all the other money? No, James, that doesn't make any sense. So what happens? It goes like this. If I have $100 of real cash 
and I put it in a bank, the bank gives me then the right to write checks for $100. But of course, they're not going to sit on that $100 waiting for me to write the checks. They're going to lend it out. Right. They take my money and pay me 1% interest, and then they loan it out to other people and charge them higher interest. And the difference between those two interests is their profit. That makes some sense. So how much of my $100 does the bank get to loan out? And how much does the government require them to keep on reserve in case I need some money? The reserve requirements are very small. You'd be surprised. If you put your money in the bank, you think they hold a lot of it and keep it safe for you. Actually, it, it, it's a very complicated formula, but for most banks, it turns out to be around 3%. So the bank sets aside a tiny fraction of my $100 and then takes the vast majority of the rest of it and as quickly as humanly possible gets rid of it. For example, the bank lends it to Sally on her credit card account so that Sally can, I don't know, go out and buy a, a Snuggie for her dog. So now a new bank account is credited with that money. That means that on top of the $100 that's credited to me and my bank, there's magically lots more dollars showing up in another bank. Sally's credit card debt is strangely created, well, more money. And what does this new bank do? It reserves a tiny fraction of Sally's debt and then lends the vast majority of that, what's left, to Frank, who goes out and buys, I don't know, a baby wall hanger. So now another bank magically has a new deposit it treats as money, even though it is just Frank's borrowed debt. In fact, Frank borrowed that debt from Sally's debt. It's just more debt. And that shows up, amazingly, not only is more debt, but is more money. And the bank that that loan goes into takes that so-called money and uses it to, I don't know, finance a corporate merger or buy repackaged mortgages from another bank. And on and on and on. Money is like a hot potato. Whoever holds it has to pass it on to somebody very quickly. You, I mean, a bank can't keep its money in the bank. They can't pay you interest, however low, without getting some. This is what's known as the fractional banking system. As you can see, every time the banks move the money, their reserves go up a fraction. But the total money supply multiplies a lot. You know, in short, this is not money. Money is not a thing. The basic money is what the government prints and declares it will support. But banks have the capacity to kind of multiply that. Here's the total amount of dollars in the world today. But here, according to the Federal Reserve Bank, is the total amount of money that's in the system. What makes up that huge difference? Well, money is usually, except for cash, money is somebody's debt, somebody's IOU. But I thought money was, you know, money. It turns out money is a mushrooming, mutating pile of debt, of IOUs, of promises, sitting on top of another pile of debt and IOUs and promises. Money is weird because it's the, it's the idea that we have in our heads. We represent it with like physical tokens, but it's really based on this general idea of trust that's sort of captured in a token. In other words, for money to be money, we all have to believe. Yes, it's all a system of beliefs and therefore very fragile. There's no way the bank actually has $10,000 for every person that has $10,000. But it doesn't matter because all you need to do is have the belief that there's $10,000 in the bank for you to be like, keep working on your, on your day. And when you do need the $10,000, chances are not everybody else is going to need the $10,000 at the same time. So, I believe money really is holy. It redeems itself. We cover a dollar bill and like pictures of dead presidents, we cover, we put in God we trust on it, we have a pyramid with an eye on it. So what happens when somebody not as credit worthy as these guys gums up the works? Things don't have to change very much for the banking system to, to begin to run into trouble. And therein lies a tale to be told. <laughs>
This is the second part of that film about money. In our last installment, we learned that money is not a thing. Money is somebody's debt, somebody's IOU. And not just any old IOU, but IOUs piled on top of IOUs in a seemingly endless chain. Cash money, the kind that Gustavo guards, actually makes up a tiny portion of what we call the total money supply. And we learned that banks actually keep very few of our dollars in their temple-like vaults. We don't actually care how much money the bank actually has, as long as we're able to make the purchases that we need. So basically, your money is in the bank, as long as you believe it is, and as long as everybody else believes it is, even though everybody knows it isn't. But we also know that the Federal Reserve Bank, which is kind of sort of part of the government, well, they do print money. And this money somehow gets into circulation in the economy. How do they do that? Here's one way. You could load up a lot of big bags full of fresh new $50 bills, pick them up in an airplane, and each day over a period of a month, go to a different American city and announce that at 12 o'clock, we're gonna open it up, the airplane flying over the city, and everybody should get out there with a garbage bag and collect it. Would that increase the money in circulation? Absolutely. Who would it benefit? The people who had big bags in the right cities at the right time. We don't do that. What we do is a very peculiar procedure. The Federal Reserve basically gives the money under various conditions to large banks. End of story. And it gives them the money and it says, please take this extra money that we're giving you, most of the time cost free, and please lend it into the economy so it circulates, you know, lend it out. The banks cooperate since they're getting cheap or costless money, which they then lend out at interest. This system has gone on steroids since the economic meltdown of 2008, with the Fed and the US Treasury pumping literally trillions of dollars into the banking system. But what have the banks done with all that free cash? The special investments that we like them to make are loans. We want them to make loans, specifically to businesses or individuals that can't get money to invest uh, in other ways. But what will they actually do, the banks? Kind of whatever works for them. Well, banks have options. The option we had hoped for was that they would lend it out to individuals and to businesses, and so the money would circulate. The banks decided to do otherwise. They said to the government, you know, you are running a big deficit. Here's your solution. You need to borrow the difference. This magic can be done if you borrow money from us. And here's very important for you to understand. The banks took the bulk of the money made available to them by the Federal Reserve and lent it to the government with the following arrangement. The rate of interest paid by banks to the Federal Reserve for fresh new money has hovered around half of 1%. The rate of return paid by the U.S. Treasury for the money it borrows from those same banks, 2 to 3%. If you understand that, you'll understand why the banks have recovered and nobody else has. Okay, so that's what's happening now after the 2008 crash. But I still don't understand how we got so close to the financial brink. I mean, I heard all about the deregulation from the Clinton years, the mortgage-backed securities, the criminal settlements with the banks. But was there some deeper underlying cause to this crisis? Over the last 40 years, real wages have been stagnating or declining. And yet productivity has shot up. So the banks have more and more money because that's a profitable situation, productivity doubling and, and, and your workers getting very little money. So the bank has to do something with it. And they got a bright idea. Well, it's really a desperate idea. They said, I know what we'll do. Instead of paying you to buy what we produce, we'll lend you the money. That was the bright idea. Well, that is a very short run idea. I mean, if I don't have $10 this year and I borrow, how am I going to have $15 and my wages aren't going up? How am I going to have $15 next year to pay you back with interest? So how did consumption go up in the last 40 years? Debt. Every time you use a credit card, you're borrowing. That's what that is. You're borrowing money. It's done electronically, but it's a debt. We made debt part of everybody's life. We gave the working class of America rising debts instead of rising wages. But when everything becomes debt, when every transaction for a bottle of water is in fact a debt, the banks who handle all debts 
become masters of the universe. But at the end of the day, whether it's tax dollars, the Federal Reserve printing money, or your deposits, isn't it our money that the banks are playing with? You're lending money to the bank when you deposit money. And this is what we forget. We forget that we are making a loan and we don't behave as creditors and therefore they don't treat us as creditors. It's like, can I keep playing with that kind of money? Those, deposit, those creditors, depositors are such nice people. They <laughs> let me play with no contract, no strings attached. To make this system work, the banks need to constantly move the debt they owe you as a depositor to the debt you owe them as a credit card user and mortgage holder. So from an ethical outlook, they want you to look like this, but they want you, in fact, they need you to party with your credit cards like that. Which is probably why we're all a little bit confused about what our society wants us to be. I mean, think of it this way. We spend a trillion dollars a year on advertising, making irrational appeals to ourselves to buy stuff that we'll have to borrow money in order to own. The goal is, in fact, to make you act like a bank to take your short-term earnings, your paycheck, and turn it into long-term debts, credit card balances, and mortgages. It's not so much that corporations are becoming people, which they are, as that people are becoming corporations. And the story of that dollar that you put in the bank, well, that's kind of like the story of how you want to look like this. But in fact, you kind of look like this. Not too dignified, I know, but if it weren't for that kind of delusion, and delusion on an awesome scale, the economy as we know it wouldn't exist. And if it's any consolation, though it's probably not, banks need the same delusions you do. A couple of key ideas from these videos. First, money only exists to the extent that we believe in it, and that belief is fragile. Second, inflation causes problems, and it makes our paychecks buy less, our goods and services sell for less, etc. The key definition of inflation is when money supply exceeds gross domestic product. The video touched on the idea of money supply. Let's take a look at just what that is. Money supply is measured as a series of M's. M0, or MB, is money that can be circulated as notes and coins. So all the notes and coins in the economy represent M0. M1 is demand deposits. The, this is money that you've deposited with your bank. M2 is savings and time deposits. So these are things that don't have immediate liquidity, but they're also uh, saved with your bank or other, other financial institution. So these are things like CDs or accounts that you can't access right away. M3 is long-term investments. The U.S. government actually stopped tracking M3 in November of 2005. Here's a chart showing how each period of expansion in the money supply has been followed by a hit of inflation. Since we're in the post-2008 period, you can understand where inflationary concerns are coming from. Which brings us back around to the gold standard. Remember our simple economy? It has two people in it. They each have currency backed by gold. They can exchange with each other. But what happens if someone else joins the economy? Essentially now you don't have enough money supply to serve all the transactions that want to happen in the economy. The gold standard approach to money supply is preventing transactions from happening and that's preventing wealth from being created. Note that gold isn't the only hard asset. Real estate is also a hard asset, for example. When inflation hits, having some hard asset usually helps protect against inflation because you own or possess the value that is being inflated rather than the currency which is being deflated. And that does it for this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video.